there is always a person in our life that we put our trust in. There may be things that we like about him or her or they like about us and we start spending time together. The person is a friend. I'm talking about a friend. And the speci specialty of a friend is from an acquaintance is that you put your trust, your faith in him. So I guess it is also an act of faith. You require faith to have a friend. Amen. Abraham, when he put his faith in God, God called him his friend. Amen. And Abraham did everything that God commanded him to do. Christ did the same. He said the same in John 15. If you do what I command you to do, you are my friends. And he, then he goes on to say, you are no longer servants for the servant does not know what the master intends. But I have told you everything that I've heard from the father. So you no longer are slaves or servants, but you are the friends of God. Amen. Are the friends of God ready to praise his name and thank him for all that he's doing? Let's all just clap our hands and worship him. Full of me, 
that you hear me when I call. Is it true that you are thinking of me? Oh, have you loved me? Praise God. Brother, sister, I want to turn to the word of God this morning. If you bought your Bibles with you, would you just open it to the gospel according to St. Luke? And let's read together in chapter 5, verse 1 onwards. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 onwards. Now so it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Jesnerit, and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitude from the boat. Now when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, you have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Hallelujah. Brother and sister, as we you know, start looking at this particular portion of scripture here, we need to understand that the setting of this particular story is the, you know, the shores of a beautiful lake in northern Israel. It is a beautiful lake and it is many a time known by the name Gennesaret. Sometimes it is called uh, Tiberias and at other times the Sea of Galilee too. Praise God. Very beautiful place. But here, the story is not really about the lake. It is about a man who suffered a setback in what he's doing. He's toiled for the whole of the night. And he himself testifies now, we've toiled all night, Master, but we've caught nothing. Meaning, his efforts have been wasted, his time has been wasted, and he's left with nothing to show for what he's been doing. But my friend, as we look at this particular person, in the story, a man named Peter, we need to understand many of us, you know, as we walk through life's paths, suffer from this kind of a disappointing situation. We are all people who look for blessing to come our way. We are all people who want our efforts to pay off and that too very richly. But times are there when uh, it simply happens so that we have got nothing to show for what we've been doing. We might toil for long hours, for a long time and at the end of it all when we take our accounts the wheel suddenly come to find that our efforts have come to naught and this is when we need to look to scripture my friend to see what we might do to actually change the situation can god help us will he these are the questions that we are faced with when our efforts turn out for nothing and today in the little time that we have before us, I want to take a look at, you know, the story of Peter and Jesus filling his boat that we are familiar with so that we might get to understand what God does in situations like this that we face in our life. I don't have the time to go through the whole story, 
I just therefore want to point your attention to a few verbs that we find in this portion of scripture. Look at this. The Bible starts off in chapter 5 saying, So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. You know, in Luke 4, we find Jesus ministry, his public ministry starting after his baptism and his fasting prayer in the wilderness. He's been anointed by the Spirit of God and he started off his ministry. And where did it start? It started in the synagogue. He opens the scrolls of Isaiah, starts reading out from it, explains things to the people seated there and goes forward. His meetings had to go on into cottages. But, you know, when the miracle started manifesting, people started thronging to where Jesus was. All of them were in need. And suddenly, people got to understand, this was a man who could meet needs. Whether it be a healing need, or a prosperity need, or a peace need, or whatever it was. Any problem that came his way, Jesus had the potent power to solve it. And he would have just send forth this power to people who were seated before him. So, multitudes started coming his way. And at the time when this story is, you know, positioned in the scriptures, the Bible is actually telling us the meetings have grown in size to such a manner whereby uh, the crowds would not just, you know, stop by filling a house. It takes a whole seashore to, you know, cover the multitudes. That is the space he requires now to conduct a meeting. Now look at this, my friend. The Bible says that Jesus... When he started preaching, there was a whole multitude waiting to listen, eagerly waiting to get a touch from him. Uh, but when we look at modern times, there are many people, you know, who call themselves servants of God, who profess to serve this very same Jesus. Now, if we were to invite one such person to come preach for a meeting, out of experience, let me tell you, one of the first things that the preacher would ask us would be, Hallelujah. How many people will be there? How many people will be there? If we say something like 50, 50, 500, many of these big shots would refuse to even turn and look our way one more time. They would ask us, what kind of offering would be waiting for me after I finish my preaching session? Would you send me an air-conditioned vehicle so that I may travel to the venue? What kind of accommodation will be arranged? These are the questions that normally come our way when we invite servants of God to come forth and serve. And many a time, because Jesus' representatives behave this way, people think Jesus is the same way. They think he is a personality who notices only crowds, who does not look at individual lives, who is interested only in the you know, big crowds and the big offerings and the big things. Praise God. But here, my friend, in verse 2, the Bible says, even in the midst of all this multitude, Jesus saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Verse 2. That is the first verb that I want to bring into your attention. You know what that is? It says, Jesus saw. Jesus saw. What did he see? He was not seeing a whole group of you know, people thronging to just get a touch from him. He was not seeing a whole group of people that were actually praising him for what he was able to do. No, he was not seeing that. He was seeing one boat, you know. And uh, that boat was not a full boat, you know. It was not a boat that had enjoyed prosperity, that had enjoyed uh, the fullness of blessing or anything like that. It was an empty boat. And it had two people at its side, washing nets, and their faces were filled with disappointment, not hope, my friend. They were filled with the disappointment of what life had handed out to them. They were filled with the disappointment of wasted effort, wasted time, of seeing that the efforts had come to naught. That was the situation these people were in. I want to tell you, friend, the world would not think about looking twice at such people. The world would not actually, hallelujah, you know, bother with such people. Many a friend of theirs would have turned their back on them at this kind of a juncture in their life, basically because they had nothing in their hands. They were empty. They were empty. They were in great need, but they were empty. But the Bible introduces us to the friend of all friends, Jesus you know the way in which the introduction comes away? It says, this Jesus sees you. Not just when you're happy and healthy 
and all prosperous in peace and doing great in life but the bible is introducing jesus to be a personality who actually takes notice of you even when you are in the depths of despair even when you end up in great disappointment even when your efforts turn to naught even when you are you know all alone with nobody to actually even notice you the bible is saying jesus sees you jesus sees you his eyes are on you my friend Am I sharing with you the story of Peter? No, that is just a vehicle for me to just pass on Jesus' message to you. What does he want you to hear? What does he want you to understand? He's telling you. Why do you cry your tears thinking you're all alone? The eyes of your creator, the creator of the universe is on you. He understands what you're going through. He sees you. He sees not just you but also your situation. He understands my friend that you've tried your best to support your family but you've got nothing to show it for it. You can't go back home. You're you're dreading the moment when your wife asks you for two fish. When your children cry because they are hungry. But the Bible is saying Jesus sees you. And the good part about the story is that when Jesus saw an empty boat and needy people he did not turn the other way and start walking he started walking towards those people in need Do you know scripture Do you know the fact that scripture says to you that this Jesus is the same yesterday today and he will be the same forever How do I show you that friend Many people when they got to know the size of your need the size of your issue the size of your problem they would have walked away from you they would not even maybe touch you with a pole that was a 10 foot pole but i want to tell you something your your issues you know your problems your troubles they do not drive jesus away from you they drive jesus to you that is the message of that verb saw Jesus sees you. But what does he do next? The Bible in verse 3 points us to another verb, you know? It is actually what I call two words put together. It says, then after he sees Peter the empty boat, the nets that they were washing, he walks to them and then verse 3 says, he got into one of the boats. Whose boat was that? Peter's boat. He got into that. that was the next thing he did he got close to the empty boat he glo- got close to the needy people and got into peter's boat now my friend this is another thing you need to pay close attention to you know why jesus when he sees your need when he sees what you're going through he won't walk away from you he will walk towards you but you need to understand something He is not a god who will stay on the outside of your life's boat and start working for you. No. Before he starts his work, before he meets your need, before he releases his miracle working power, his way making power into your life, he wants to be inside your life's boat. This is a desire Jesus has. The desire Jesus has. But people, they do not really understand this. I'm often times reminded of a friend that I have in a place called Changanur, you know. He was a great businessman, he made a lot of millions. And when he decided on building a house, he uh, brought the best architect possible, the best civil contractors possible. And he started building a, a huge mansion out there. It had so many luxuries inside that he decided Indian locks are not enough. I need to bring a lock from somewhere else while he was on his tours he started looking around for the best lock in the world possible bought on a lock from singapore and you know he did, he was trying to decide where to put it see he had actually built up a huge bedroom that also served as a an office you know he had a fax machine there a computer there he had a small bar there He had so many so many so many so many things there so many valuables were there there inside that locker that he had kept inside the bedroom so he decided let me put this lock on the bedroom door 
What is the speciality about this log? The sellers had told them, once it gets to be logged, without its key, nobody can open that. That was a guarantee. So one day, while this rich guy, this rich friend of mine, he was sleeping, the phone rang. And like every one of us do, he jumped out of his sleep, took the cordless phone, and because an interesting conversation had started, he started, you know, walking up and down in his bedroom. Not realizing where he was going, he walked out of his bedroom. Suddenly a small breeze blew that had a little force. The bedroom door came and closed. This guy was outside, talking on his cordless phone. Three, four, five minutes passed. Five minutes down the line, when he put the phone down, cut the connection, you know what? He finds his bedroom door closed, and because it was not an Indian lock, he could not open it without that lock's key. He started thinking what to do. He tried pushing it, prodding it, kicking the door. It wouldn't open. So finally, he took out his Padinatta Madhava. You know what that was? He went to the locksmith that was living close by. I said, man, come, come please. Please open this door. And he had an adava that nobody else had. He had a hammer and a small chisel, you know. He bought it and, you know, started beating at the lock. You need to understand, even foreign locks succumb to chisels, you know, and lots of hammering. So the rich guy is looking, carefully looking, what the locksmith is doing. And this guy puts a chisel, takes a hammer and is hammering on, hammering on. The rich guy is looking and suddenly he, ha he has a click, understands that the door is open. And you know what the rich guy does? He just jumps in front of the door and stands his way. Why? What is he doing? What is he doing? If you ask the rich guy, he'll say, I needed the locksmith to actually open the shut door. But I don't want him to come in. I've got a lot of valuables inside. I don't want him to even see it. I just want him to go now. He's done his job. He's done his job. Opened the shut door for me. Small story from the past, but you need to understand. This is the same approach many people have to Jesus too. When doors shut before them, they want Jesus to come in and open the door for them. But once the door is opened, they want Jesus to take a taxi and go off. They don't want him to come in. But the problem, if I may call it so, with Jesus is the fact that he will never ever work from the outside of the, your life. He wants you to let him in. He wants you to let him in. When the Bible says here that he got into one of the boats that was Peter's, you need to understand the implication here. You need to understand the fact that he got in because Peter let him in, my friend. Peter let him in. This is something Jesus wants you to understand. This is something Jesus wants you to think about today. Many a time, when we seat ourselves in God's presence and we start praying, we ask Him, Lord, deliver me, work a miracle in my life, give me this, give me that, open new doors, give me new contracts. You know what we do? We are saying, open that shut door, God. Jesus will ask you, and then we say, Go your way. I'll call you the next time I have need. But I want you to get understanding about one fact this morning. Jesus is not the lock, locksmith. He is actually the Lord of all things. And you've got to understand one principle here. Like those great preachers of old said, if he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. 
He is not just Lord over the locked doors in your life. He wants to be Lord over your, your, your boat, the boat of your life. How do you let him be what he wants to be? You accept him. You receive him. You let him in, my friend. Peter did just that. And I want to tell you, that is when the setback started becoming a setup for a comeback, my friend. That is when things started changing. That is when things started turning around. When he let Jesus into his boat. He got into second world. And now, look at what happens. The third thing in verse 3 that we see is, then he got into one of the boats which was Simon's and asked him to put, a little, put out a little from the land. What did Jesus do next? What did Jesus He started talking to Simon. He was not talking, how are you Simon? Is your health alright? That was not the conversation. He was saying, Simon, you are not where I want you to be. The conversation goes this way. You are not where I want you to be. You have got to reposition yourself if I should bless you. Get from where you are to where I want you to be. Be ready to accept change. Be ready to move forward. Right now you are in comfortable waters. You know where you are. You love things there. But I want you to go out into the deep. If you're willing to reposition yourself, because I tell you to, that is when my blessing is going to manifest in your life. Bring change, bring about change, reposition yourself. That is what Jesus is talking about here. I want to repeat one thing I told you earlier. You know what that is? Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. And this might be one of the you know, singular reasons as to why many people refuse to let him into the boat of their life. If he would just come in, and go to the moolah there and keep quiet we wouldn't mind him coming in actually we don't mind him sitting in the showcase do you he's on a cross somewhere nailed to that wooden piece we are okay with it what but when he comes in and turns out to be a live god who speaks to us about changing our lives that is when we get irritated But let me repeat the story one more time. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. Once he really comes into your life's boat, he'll start talking to you about repositioning your life. He'll tell you where you are is not where he wants you to be. He'll tell you about what changes to make. Get this into your heart, friend. Get this into your heart. Many people... If they would, you know, uh, see Jesus seated quietly somewhere, they would have no problem accepting him into their lives. But Jesus is not like that. He will not keep silent and let you be living any which way you want to. No. You need to understand something, friend. However you are when you get to him, Whatever you've done, wherever you've been, he'll accept you the way you are when you go there. But you need to understand something about Jesus. He'll never let you stay the way you are. That, I believe, is the difference between normal friends and the true friend. Friends, you know, they'll accept you for who you are. They won't criticize you. They'll enjoy your company. You'll enjoy theirs too because they are non-critical. But the true friend, he loves you too much to let you stay the way you are. He'll press for change. Change in your character, change in your lifestyle, change in the way you talk and you walk. Why? Because he wants you to develop, not stay the way you are. 
He wants you to be blessed, not, you know, maintain the status quo. You need to understand this, friend. You need to understand this. Jesus is that kind of a true friend. So once he comes into the boat, he'll start talking to you about what changes you need to make. What do you do then? Don't try to resist him. Don't try to say, I know better. No. Do what is necessary to bring the changes into your life that Jesus desires. What is the practical application? How do you get to hear Jesus talking to you about change? Simple. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Not dutifully, but prayerfully. Not to find promises, but to actually find commandments from God. Pray not the prayer. God, give me a promise that I can hold on to. Tell him, God, command me so that I can do what I need to do to get blessed. Rabbis who actually studied the Bible, they say there are 603 commandments in scripture. I've gotten to something like 40 odd only. I'm still struggling to, you know, obey what I already know. But I want to tell you something. All of these commandments have conditions attached to it, you know, and blessings, promises attached to it. Many people say, the Bible is actually a treasure house of promises. It is. But I want to tell you something. Almost every promise has a condition attached to it. Read your Bible, friend, to get introduced to your true friend. Read your Bible, my friend, to understand what he wants you to do. He'll start speaking to you. He'll start speaking to you. He'll tell you. Put out a little from the land, meaning get to where I want you to be. And then, the next thing Jesus does is, the Bible says, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. <coughs> what is this all about? Before I go into all that, I'll tell you one thing. I praise God for Peter. You know why? If it was me, I would have had a hundred questions for Jesus right at that moment. Lord, I toiled for the whole night. I was tired. I was washing my nets. You made me get into my boat and, you know, uh, sail till here. You made me take the effort to change so many things. And now, even before you fill my boat, you're starting to do other things. You've forgotten about me? I'm not going to let you forget me. You're trying to do something else. I'm going to obstruct you if you try to bless another person before you bless me. Right? Peter said, or maybe not in words, but in deeds. Peter just conveyed the message to Jesus. Jesus, Lord, do something. Thank you for coming into my boat. This is not really my boat, it is my life. If you want to sit here and teach, if you want to make my life a platform for you to be known to people, I say, I'm ready. Not my will, but thine be done. Friend of mine, can I ask you a question? Many a time, when you start reading your Bible and understanding what Jesus wants you to do, when you hear his voice through the Bible, asking you to change, asking you to reposition yourself, you come to a point when you start having a question deep down inside of your heart. How do I know if I've reached the position where Jesus wants me to get to? How do I know? How do I know? How do I know? Let me tell you this, my friend. You'll know it when inside what you want to happen most is not my will but his that is the correct position for blessing why do i say this because 
even though god has a purpose and a plan to bless you he's got a greater plan and that is to make you a blessing you can be blessed because you also desire it but for you to be a blessing for others you need to have an inner change whereby you don't want your will to happen but his you want to glorify him in everything you do you want to get his will done in the lives of others that is the repositioning god is looking for in your life even when you are asked to wait for what you're looking for even when god acts in a manner that you feel he's forgotten about you he's forgotten about your need he has not heard your prayers properly even then like as half in psalm 73 you tell him but still i am still waiting in your presence god i'm not planning to run away from you i'm not planning to throw the faith away i'm going to stand strong steady in your presence because i know once i've gotten into the right relationship with you it is only a matter of time before the blessing comes after me i'm going to focus on the relationship not on receiving what i can from you because i know relationships side effect will be reception peter allowed jesus to do what he wanted peter was willing to wait for god's timing peter was willing to let go of his will his goals his plans his interests so that his plans might be done and in verse 4 the bible says when he had stopped speaking when he had stopped speaking when he had stopped speaking he said to simon launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch another question here when will he stop speaking let me tell you my friend sometimes we voice desires unto god lord bless me lord heal me lord do this for me lord i want this job we voice needs to god but can i tell you something at times god even though he is you know powerful enough to do what you are asking him to do in a second he lets you wait why so that you through your waiting can still pursue what you're looking for it is not just running after that is pursued sometimes you pursue something by just simply hanging on holding on waiting many blessings from god come to you without you even asking for them he gives it to you freely some you got to do certain things for some you've got to wait wait you got to patiently wait so that he can bring the fullness of blessing into your life patience is such a you know valued virtue in the spirit realm which is why through the things you suffer god teaches you patience i'm quoting james he brings out of you the fruit of patience why does he want you to wait hold on and still pursue because pursuit is what shows earnestness what you are willing to let go will never be valued in your life what you are willing to wait for pursue work for that is what will be valued in your life and god does not want his gifts to be abused or misused he wants every gift of his to be utilized to his fullest valued to his fullest developed he gives you with certain things so that your gift can become a blessing for others the gift need not necessarily be the gift of healing or the gift of prophecy it can be a gift of money it can be the gift of listening ability where you can listen to another person's need waiting just simply silently so that he can share his heart with you 
Sometimes all it takes to, you know, comfort a person who's in great dire distress is, listen to him. Listen. When they pour out their heart, they feel better. <laughs> Many a time, because we do not have the gift of patience, we can't do that. But times are there when Jesus takes us through situations like this and he keeps speaking to us about changing our lives and he does something else. When will he stop speaking? When he knows you're not going to let go of the faith of him, the author of your faith, of what you wanted, what you are asking for. He stopped speaking and said, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. <coughs> what is this? Jesus, you're the carpenter, I'm the fisherman. You know the woodwork workshop, I know the sea. I know how to fish, I've been trained at this, you are not trained in this. I can tell you a thousand reasons as to why this time is not suitable for fishing. Fish come out in the dark night, that is why I was toiling in the night. This is daytime, with the sunlight switched on, uh, the fish are not going to come out. These are things we normally do. But Peter adds on with one more thing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. What is that? Lord, I don't really understand what you're talking about. But because you say so, I'll just do it. A big time key to empty boats getting filled. Because you say so, I'll do it. We are people who want to understand first. We are people who need our explanations first. But God would tell us, I've called you not to walk by sight, but by faith. Believe when you obey the blessing will manifest. Believe when you obey, your need will be met. Believe when you obey, I'll come through to give you your breakthrough. Believe. Peter said, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. Say this much, friend. For the boat to become full. Peter did not change his boat, did not change his net, did not change his partners, did not change his trade. The only difference before and after was Jesus in his boat and Peter submitting to Jesus. Many a time we Christians who can believe Jesus and his word to be saved, you know, to be saved. We put our trust in Him for our sins to be forgiven, for us to be heaven bound in our life's journey. We put our trust, our faith in Him. Many times, people who are saved, people who can believe this, what the world would call an absurd story about a blood that is years old but not even refrigerated that can cleanse you. People who can have the faith to believe all that. They cannot bring themselves to believe in, trust in and obey God when he starts talking to you about day-to-day -day life. But true Lordship comes when Jesus is not just Lord on Christmas or Easter or Passover. Not just in the morning or in the middle of the night. He is Lord over your life 24-7, all through the years of your life. And that is what Jesus is looking for. Sometimes for you to really realize where you are, for you to really realize the Father's house was better, you need to be you know, allowed to get yourself into a pigsty. 
Sometimes it takes an empty boat to get you to think about what God wants you to think about. Sometimes losses are needed, sometimes pain is required, sometimes a beating is part of the bargain so that you might get related to God properly, so that you might reposition yourself from where you are to where God wants you to get to. And I'll tell you the reason why God allows such things. It is basically because Jesus, you know, more than he wants you happy, he wants you in heaven. Didn't get that or didn't like that? More than you enjoying happiness today. More than you living pain-free today, tear-free today. Jesus is more interested in you being with him all through eternity. And if it takes pain now for that great gate, great gain to come your way, he's all right with the idea. And I'll repeat it once more. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and will be the same forever. Get right with him. Would you stand in God's presence? Take a moment to close your eyes, open your heart, and talk to Jesus. If you can believe that he is seeing you right where you are, and he understands what you're going through, would you just take a moment to thank him? Lord, thank you, because your eyes are not just on the sparrow, but they are also on me. Thank you. Can you in your spirit see him walking towards you? When many people walked away, when many people turned their back on you, can you see him walking towards you? And right now, I want to tell you, he's looking at you, asking you, would you let me come in? What is your boat? It is on one hand your life, it might be on the other hand, an area of your life that you've not allowed Jesus to properly be Lord over. It is something you need to think about. But in that area that he is not part of, in that area where he is not Lord over, that is where Jesus is looking at you and telling you, would you let me in? Would you let me talk to you about change would you let me reposition your life would you let me use your boat to be the platform on which I can put my feet on I'm not going to place it on top of my head I'm going to place it under my feet would you let me to use you if so if you're willing to, let my will be done. My will will bring you out of darkness into marvelous light. It will bring you out of the curse into great blessing. It will bring you from emptiness into fullness. Let's pray. Father Divine, I commit all of these the children into your mighty hands. As I leave them, with this, these thoughts, O oh God, that you granted me. I pray that your Holy Spirit will keep ministering to their hearts. As they go back home, on the way back, Lord. All those moments in this day that are left with us, keep speaking to them. Let them know you better. Let them get a deeper, greater revelation of your will. Let them be able to get right with you, O oh God. And let them be able to submit to your will, I pray. And once you get that done, I pray, let emptiness be taken out of their life. Let fruitlessness be taken out of their life. In Jesus' name, I just raise my hand and I bless them in your name, Jesus. I pray, let my words of blessing be a cause of blessing for them. In Jesus' name, and all the saints said, Amen. Brother, sister, thank you so very much for coming today. 
It's been a joy to have you with us. And God willing, we'll be here next Sunday also at 10 o'clock for the English service. And we'll meet again. May God be with you. May he bless you. May he make his face to shine upon you and keep you by the light of his countenance. May every good thing outlined in the word of God be yours this day and forevermore. In Jesus' name, be blessed. See you next week. God be with you.